All right, make sure you guys are in the right spot. This is Linear Algebra, Math 2164, Section 6, and I am Dr. John R. Taylor. Uh, this is usually the smallest class I get to teach, but I've got about 43 students in here, and a couple of seats are missing, which means they're missing, but uh, we're going to be kind of tight in here. I just pretty much guarantee that, but it's a nice size. you got this little space where you're sitting at and stuff like that, but no more can add this class because... There are no seats available according to what the class can hold versus how many people are actually signed up for the class. Um, this is linear algebra, but I look in your bright and shiny faces and I see a lot of my Calc 1 and Calc 2 students, uh, former Calc 1 and Calc 2 students in here. Uh, so, but this is going to be different from my Calc 1 and Calc 2. I don't have a guided notebook for you guys or anything like that. You're going to go old school. You're going to take your own notes. You're now in the you know, sophomore level of classes and stuff. So, but... This is linear algebra, solving systems of equations, a very important class. And actually, it's not that hard of a class. There are some, there's going to be some aspects of it that are, that are uh, interesting and dynamic and things that we can do with this stuff. The problem with this class is very simply this. Manipulating systems of equations. And in, within that manipulation, we do a lot of things like fractions and and adding and subtracting numbers and doing a bunch of stuff in our head. You see where I'm going with this. The problem with this class is careless errors. Careless error kills. One careless error completely destroys your answer. You get the actual wrong answer. And that makes it tough from a grading perspective because I know what the answer is. You didn't get that answer, which means you made some bonehead careless error someplace. So how do I grade something like that? Well, where did you make your bonehead careless error? Was it at the beginning of the problem or at the end of the problem? So I gotta go figure out where exactly you made that bonehead careless error. And based upon proximity to the actual answer will be some type of distribution of what your, how many points are gonna be deducted off the thing. So if you screw it up from the beginning, well, you don't get many points. If you screw it up at the end, but all the other stuff is, and you can't figure out that one plus one is two, you with one plus one is, you get one out of it because you multiplied it instead of added or something or other. Again, you got the wrong answer, you know, the, the solution is wrong and bridge doesn't make it on the side of the river and people die. It's all your fault. Careless error kills. You just got to be intentional with careless error. That's the hard part of this class because it's real simple to make a careless error with this stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. You'll be using your calculator and I'll show you some tricks on the calculator and things like that. But most of the stuff you want to have the ability to kind of do it on your own within your head. You know, so it's basic adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, but you know, that does tend to lead to some careless errors, and that's the tough part of this class. All right, so let's go over the class. Now, I've got a kind of a more of a minim minimalistic approach on the uh, Canvas page on this stuff here. Um, this is our Canvas page, and I put it under the student view so you guys get to see uh, pretty much exactly uh, what, what you, I, I see what you guys see. So this, I, this is Intro to Linear Algebra, Math 61, uh, 2164, Section 6. I'm Dr. John R. Taylor. Um, our class is on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1130. We're here in Friday Built Room 106. And over here is the syllabus. And on the syllabus here, I also have, you know, you can download the syllabus off this thing here, but here's a copy of it. And I have a happen, to, happen to have a copy right here. So let's take a look at it real quick. All right, so this is our course. Here's my syllabus. All right, so my office is over there in Fretwell 335A. Uh, this day and age, the best way to get a hold of me is obviously through email, uh, more than actually phoning me or anything like that. Um, so there's my email address. Right now, subject to change, because this is the first week of class and the administration has me on this committee, that committee, and every other committee you can think of, my office hours may change. But for right now, my office hours are, uh, let's see, Mondays and Wednesdays from 1 to 2, and Tuesdays and Thursdays from 8.45 to 9.45, and of course, by appointment. If you can't make those things, I'm always willing to go by appointment. And hey, we're post-COVID, which means I got Zoom, and I can do all kinds of mess with you guys and things of that stuff. So... And I've even got doc cams in my office and stuff like that. So I can explain things through Zoom as well. All right. Uh, grades, well, obviously, this is college. So 10-point grading scale. 
90 to 100 is an A, 82 to 90 is a B, so forth and so on. Um, my, my tests are going to be, uh, excuse me, my grades are going to be determined by test. My goal is to have three tests in here. We're going to cover five chapters, but we're going to have three tests so it doesn't quite evenly distribute out. Um, with those three tests, uh, that will make up 50% uh, of your grade. There will be homework, and I'm going to do two different kinds of homework. I'm going to do traditional homework and an online homework. And with the online homework, our textbook is the um, Pearson chapter, uh, excuse me, sixth edition. I've got a copy of the fifth edition. They're, they're sending me the sixth edition, but the sixth edition is what the bookstore happens to have. And with the Pearson stuff, there's also this code thing that you use to actually access the Pearson My Lab thing, which is where my homework set's going to be at. Okay? Uh, so with that being said, uh, I'm going to do two different kinds of homeworks. For each homework that I said I set up, I'm going to do a traditional homework, which will be kind of small, and I'll do kind of an online homework. Between the two, we're going to really generate some, some numbers here. Uh, that'll be worth 20% of your grade. You will need a TI-83-84 calculator. You'll appreciate that later. I'm going to show you some stuff on the calculator and what the calculator can do for you, and it will help you with some of those bonehead careless errors. But, uh, you know, I won't let you use the calculator just to cheat and get the answer. you got to show me the work involved. But it's nice when the calculator can actually show you what the answer is and go, okay, I screwed it up someplace. I need to fix it, okay? And then the last thing is 30% um, uh, for the final exam. That's a departmental directive. Uh, according to what I saw from the registrar, uh, the um, final exam in here will be on December the 13th, which is a Tuesday from 11 to 1.30. Okay, that'll be in our classroom and stuff. Okay, um, attendance policy, this is college. You're expected to show up to class. This is also math, which means it was more important, which means you really got to show up to math because this is a type of a class you can't afford to miss out on just like your calculus two days and stuff like that. You miss out on something or other from class, you are going to have a difficult time in making that connection from uh, going back and trying to read the textbook and grab information from it and stuff like that, and then keeping up with the next day in class and stuff. So the do not uh, miss class. However, you know, basically um, I take the same policy that I did when I was in teaching calculus class, and that is, I deduct points for bad attendance. I give you bonus stuff for good attendance. So the motivation is, is that bonus points for good attendance. So as I've wrote, written over here, if you have more than three absences, excused or unexcused, uh, your, your grade will be lower by our letter grade. And if you have more than five absences, let's see here, we meet two days a week. You got more than five. You missed two and a half weeks of this class? <laughs> You're failing anyway. Um, might as well make it official. So don't miss class. You come to class, you will learn something or other, and you can take that home. But once you miss, start missing class, it, it is going to be exponentially decreasing in terms of your average in this class. You can't afford to miss this level of a math class. Okay? Um, um, you need to bring your calculator every day to class because I want to show you some stuff here. You may not borrow calculators during the test. I caught some dude doing that. Really? That's called cheating. Um, but, you know, just I made it official on my, on my little website here. Uh, and like I said, the 30% uh, uh, of your grade is going to be, uh, like I said, the final exam. And it was going to be a cumulative final exam, as all good exams are. But here's uh, the other deal. Arriving late or leaving early will be counted as absence. Uh, it is very important for you to never miss class for any reason. However, if you do miss class, it is your responsibility to get the notes from someone other than me, because I just make up this stuff as we go along. Uh, in class and understand the material on your own. Study policy and tutoring. Once again, I remind you, this is college effort. Study is a requirement to pass the class. Every hour we're in class is between one and two hours of homework to be done. However, in my class, you know, uh, if you um, can do the homework and understand this material, this class should earn you a good grade on your GPA. And I want you to read this part. My tests come directly from the homework and the pro problems that I do as examples in class. Therefore, once again, it's very important for you to do the homework, rework the examples I do in class. If you still need extra help besides coming by my office during office hours, there's always open tutoring at the Math Learning Center, uh, across the hall from the Math Department, and don't forget the Academic Excellence Center over in Covart and stuff. So there's, apps, there's ways of getting some assistance 
use this material if you are having some issues. Go seek that out. That's the great thing about UNC Charlotte. We've got a support system like nobody's business. We've got the Math Learning Center right across from the Math Department. You've got me as a resource. I've got uh, Jacob over here in the corner. He's actually my grader for this semester, kind of my go-to guy, so he's going to be sitting in here in the class with us and stuff. So I'm going to declare him to be a, a GTA there. Congratulations. Give you a promotion. No, no money in it. Um, and so there is uh, lots of resources you can get. You also got COVAR, you know, the Mac Academic Learning Center, um, and, and, and the material that they provide over there and stuff like that. So, and up to, up to tutoring, one, one hour per week on tutoring, but it's a first-come, first-serve basis. So you've got to go sign up for that type of stuff. So there's, my point is there's help to be had if you need it, okay? Um, but uh, hopefully you won't. And um, I had these classes when I was at State that my professor, it would just bug me to no end, that he would go over uh, some problems in class and material in class, and I understood those, and I could do those problems like, mm, no problem at all. But somehow the questions he put on the test didn't seem to relate to any of the questions or any of the material or anything he's ever discussed in class before. Yeah, that, that heart-sinking feeling when you take one of those tests going, I don't even understand the question, more or less know how to answer the darn thing. I'm not that professor. What I do in class, I'm going to show you how to do this stuff, and I can show you something at where this stuff is applied at. But my goal is to get you guys to be able to do what I do so you can handle any kind of problem we throw at you guys. I'm not going to throw any curveballs and throw problems at you. To, um, I mean, for example, I had a professor at State, and this is when I was in calculus class. He, he would you know, give your test. And he would have one question worth like 11 points from the next chapter to see if you were reading ahead. In calculus? <laughs> Whatever. So, but why 11 points? This is how he separated A's from B's in his class. Now, you know, I expect half the people knew calculus and stuff, but they want to know if they were reading ahead and stuff like that. Good students should be studying ahead. This is how he separated his A students from his B students. Well, on that first test, well, I got caught cold because I didn't read ahead. Second, third, and fourth test, no, I knew, I knew his game plan. I played chess with this man. I knew what his moves were at, and I won that game and made my A. I'm not that guy either. The stuff I cover in my class, the cover stuff I cover on homeworks and stuff like that, that's what kind of questions are going to be in your test. So I'm going to be very upfront and straightforward with this type of stuff. I'm not going to be the professor just to see how bad I can make my GPA out of your your grades and stuff. No, I like good GPA. I got a reputation around here that most students do incredibly well in my class. Keep up my, my reputation if you don't mind. Study this stuff. It's all you got to do apply yourself. All right. So, um, again, uh, review sessions and tutoring. I talk about walk in tutoring and stuff like that. Uh, makeup and late work policy. Uh, you know, I tend to typically post solutions due to the nature of the course. There's not much on the late late work and makeup policy because I post solutions, so don't be late on the, on the homework and stuff like that. Uh, academic integrity, uh, cheating is bad. Uh, don't have me put you in front of the board and actually have you dismissed from the university and all other colleges that will never take you again. It's not worth it. Just study this stuff. Now, again, another one of those things that kills me. I have, you know, I teach Calc 1 or Calc 2, and I have some student that wants to cheat in my class. My first question to him is always this. What's your major? Mechanical engineering. And you want to cheat on a calculus test? Do you have any idea of how important this material is in your future and you're trying to basically cheat your way out of a decent grade even though you don't know the material? Oh, it will bite you in the end, I guarantee it. Linear algebra is the same way. You really need to know this stuff because this stuff does have overtones into so many different that's my goal is to show you that and to get you well prepared so when you in your in whatever major you happen to be in I mean here I probably got a lot of computer science majors in particular but as well as engineering majors especially mechanical and electrical those circuits that out turn into a matrix faster than you can blink your eye so all those things you'll see this stuff again and I can prepare you for this type of material that's my goal okay um, Again, uh, always uh, turn off your electronic devices, computer stuff. Your focus should be actually up here. 
the one computer device that I want you to actually have on, which I'll be using quite a bit, is this thing here. I brought my T84, and that's what I'm going to use because it's got some really cool buttons on this thing and some great programming. I'm just setting you guys up for something or other to help you guys out. Now, if you've got a Casio or some of these other type things, I couldn't help you out with that anyway. I don't know what their programming is, but I do know the programming on the Texas Instruments, so I'm going to help you out with that. All right, um, and the other big thing in terms of my syllabus is I try to give you kind of a lecture-by-lecture lecture series of what I'm covering and when I'm going to give you tests and stuff like that. I didn't actually put any dates on this thing. I just basically gave you lecture one. I'm going to introduce myself, go over the policy, and I'm going to talk about section 1.1. Lecture two, I'm going to be going into section 1.2. There'll be some layovers and stuff like that, but you can see from the way I've described it, you know, what sections we're covering, where we're going to be at, when the test is going to be, and then the next one, see, so test one is just going to be chapter one. Test two is going to be chapter two and three, and test three is going to be chapters four and five. That's how I broke it up and put the next two in there. Okay. And there's going to be lots of homework sets all along the way. And this is how you really learn this material and stuff. So let me get back over here to my uh, Canvas page. And if you come over here to modules, okay, here we go. I've already got up here a online homework set, and I went ahead and decided to go ahead and post it for you. The traditional homework set, you know what traditional means where I come from? Paper, pencil. Print this thing out, write on it, and turn it in. It's due on September 6th, so you've got like two weeks plus here. All right, so. Um, I've already got these things set up, but this is your online homework number one. Now, uh, with this one, it's probably going to give me an error message on this thing. Uh, yeah, you got your Pearson and all this stuff and stuff because I'm on the uh, user-friendly thing here in terms of you got to type in your uh, license agreement and access code. When you buy the book, you get the access code and all that good stuff. All right, but um, if I get out of, let's see here, leave student view. Let's see what happens here. If I leave the student view, uh, it's still going to give me that thing over here and all that good stuff. Um, it does for you guys it registers in there I actually have to go through the actual stuff so I've got some stuff that I'm setting up for you guys but yeah I'm, I'm gonna it will it will uh, I have to register the class I'm the man I'm the professor so I got a backdoor into this thing but you guys should have direct links and stuff like that and if you have a problem with the link let me know uh, I may be something with you it may be something with the Pearson people We'll figure it out and stuff like that. Pearson also has uh, you know, something on their website to be able to get you know, help if they're having some issues and stuff like that. But do let me know about it and stuff like that. So there we go. So let's get started with linear algebra. Any questions before I get started? Okay. All right. So we're going to start with our famous section 1.1. So if you got to start, might as well start in the beginning. Here it is. This is called Systems of Linear Equations. All right. Systems of Linear Equations. So what is the big deal? Now, again, what I'm trying to do is tie what you've known in the past, high school, some, some college classes and stuff like that, to what we're about to do with this stuff. So I'm going to go a little easier on you right from the beginning here. So what is a system of a linear equation? Well, it would be something like this. You get A times X plus B times Y equals C. That's a linear equation where the X and the Y are your variables. A, B, and C are some kind of constant. So when you look at this thing, the classic x, y variables, a, b, and c are constants. You know, 3x plus 2y equals 17 or something like that. Okay? But because I have two variables, two unknowns, x and y, I need to have another equation. dx plus ey equals f. So there it is. The old autofocus there. There we go. So I've got system of equations. I got two equations because I have two variables. There's a pattern here. The number of variables should at least match up to the number of equations you got. If you have a chance, 
of the solving this guy. Solving it means to solve this system of equations. You want to tell me uh, pretty much what's x equal to and what's y equal to. Okay. But with this, here's your problem. In this scenario, and I'm going something that I can actually graph, so that's why I took two variables on this thing. There are three possible answers. Now, this is a linear equation, ax plus by equals c. You can graph a linear equation, solve for y. The old one, turn it into y equals mx plus b. You got your y-intercept and you got your slope and stuff like that. So this, these are lines. That's my point. These are not, it's not x squared or, a, or y cubed or anything like that. Just plain old x and plain old y. These are linear, these are lines. So, there are three scenarios of the answer. What are the three scenarios? Okay, I'm going to graph this guy here. Here's your x-axis and your y-axis. And you graph the two guys. So, here is, I'll call this L1 for, y, y, or for line 1. Here is L2 for uh, line 2. And you get that guy right there. So that right there is your x, y, you have a point, okay? And with this point, the, we would call this exactly one solution. That's it. x equals 5, y equals 4. You get a solution. Your problem is going to come in when I start doing this. x equals 2 thirds and y equals negative 1 half. I start throwing fractions at you guys and watch you guys completely fall apart. It's sad, okay? Lots of fractions in this class, and that's where that careless error bonehead stuff comes in handy. So we're going to work on your algebra skills in this class. But for one case one here, you get exactly one solution, okay? There is this case here. Case two. Graph it. Here's your x-axis. Here's your y-axis. And I got over here. Here is when you graph it. Here's your line one. And when I graph it, here is your line two. Where is the solution? So in this one, this would be a no solution situation. A no solution. We would call this, first off, the exactly one solution, let me get my fancy words up here, would be called a consistent, unique solution. That's when you get one answer. For no solution, we call that inconsistent. So, okay, it's no solution, but if we're going to be fancy about our terminology, we would call this inconsistent. There's no solution on this thing. So in this case, because I have a two-variable case, these two lines are parallel. They do not intersect. So we're looking for the point of intersection. This does not have any point of intersection. No solution, an inconsistent system. But there's a third case. Your third case is this. Here is line one. Here is line two. Line one is equal to line two. So the lines lie on top of each other. So I'm looking for the point of intersection. How many points of intersection are there? There's an infinite. Every point in, on the line, every point on the line is a point of intersection. So we would say this would be infinite, infinitely many solutions. You've got to be on the line. I mean, point over here doesn't work, but every point on this line actually is a, a solution. And But we would call this, and because there is a solution, there's a lot of them, get used to the terminology. The word consistent means it has a solution. Inconsistent is no solution. Consistent, unique, means there is a solution, there's only one. So for infinite number of solutions, this thing is going to be called consistent, because there are solutions on this thing, but it's, instead of unique, it is infinite. Cons 
consistent implement. Does that make sense? Consistent unique, one solution. Consistent infinite, many solutions. But they got to be on the line. Okay? Now, what we're going to be going after is basically this. How do we solve a system of equations and stuff? Okay? Now, if I give you something like this, a question, sorry. Uh, so the next thing is uh, you said the first one is infinite. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, it's infinite now. <laughs> there you go. I'm four steps ahead thinking about lunch. All right, so consistent infinite. There's an infinite number of solutions. All right. So, and I'm actually thinking about this example here. So, I got a question for you. Here, is a system of equations. X plus 4Y equals 5. 2X minus Y equals 3. My question to you is this. How would you solve this system of equations? I mean, I got three options here. Could be unique solution, Consistent, unique. Could be infinite number of solutions, consistent, infinite, or it could be inconsistent, no solution at all. And how do I know? What would you do? Okay. So let's let, let us use exactly excellent. Let's use terminology. That is called substitution method. You would solve your words. The first equation for one of the variables, I think the easiest one to solve for would be x, right? So in your words, this is the substitution method. Okay? So you're going to solve this guy for x. So, and again, I'll write it in your words, solve for x. That would give me x is equal to, to solve for x, I would subtract 4y from both sides. So x would be equal to negative 4y plus 5, right? And again, I'm trying to describe this. Now, question for you guys. How many folks in here are in uh, computer science? That's pathetic. We got 99%. Okay, all right. Not a surprise, is my point. All right. So... When you do computer science, you need to have algorithms, right? What exactly is an algorithm? Come on, computer science. Don't you like do algorithms like every day? What's an algorithm? Well, not necessarily repetition, but that sequence of events. You're describing, basically, the process at which you want the program to run, right? That's your algorithm. We're creating an algorithm here. So tell me what to do. I'm trying, again, using terminology here. All right, so, first one, I solve for one of the variables. In this case, I solve for x. And then what do we do? We're going to sub into... Second equation, right? So the second equation was 2 times x, but we're going to replace the x with negative 4y plus 5, and that'll be minus y, and that's equal to 3. Does that make sense? I just replaced the x with the other equation. Now, what did this do for me? This allowed me to have an equation with how many variables in it now? One variable. You got an equation with one variable you should be able to solve for. So now we're going to solve this guy for y. So to clean it up, I'm going to distribute. This would be negative 8y plus 10 minus y equals 3. Agreed? A minus 8y minus y is a minus 9y plus 10 equals 3. I'm going to subtract 10 from both sides. Negative 9y equals negative 7. 
Then I'm going to divide by negative 9 on both sides, and I end up getting y is equal to reducing my fraction by killing off the negatives. I got y equals 7 9. Agree? All right. You guys are kind of slow on the day, but I know what your problem is. The answers are fractions. People start to sweat and start to shake because it always gets worse if I start throwing some irrational numbers at you guys. So, fractions. Now, but for a solution, you know, a solution is either a point, which gives you that unique solution. Does that make sense? Or it's an inconsistent, no solution, or consistent, infinite. All right? So, here we go. How do I get the answer? The answer, because we got a Y, the answer is going to be this consistent unique. Does that make sense? But to get the unique, you've got to have what the X is. How do I figure out what X is? Now, i got Y now. How do I go back and figure out what X is? All right. We're going to go and back substitute. into the other equation. What was my other equation? Well, it was with this equation. We already got the x. x is equal to negative 4y plus 5. It's already solved for x. You might as well use that guy. Does that make sense? So when I do that, x is equal to negative 4 times y, which is 7 ninths plus 5. So x is equal to, what is this, negative 28 ninths plus 5. So x is equal to negative 28 ninths, 28 ninths, plus 5 in terms of 9, 5 is 45 over 9, right? And so what exactly is negative 28 plus 45? Negative 28 plus 45, okay, I'm cheating on my calculator. 17, so what do I end up getting? 17 knots. You guys look at me like I beat your dog or something over here. I don't know. Let's double check this here, huh? So if we're going to do it, let's do it right. So negative 4 times 7 ninths, even though I did that one by hand, all right, plus 5, and end up getting crappy decimal, convert it to a fraction. I feel better about myself. Now, 17 ninths, I can do basic arithmetic here, but how do I write my answer? So you got the x, which is 17 ninths, but it's important to write the answer in the context of the problem. The answer is the point of intersection. So... It's a point, so x was what, 17 ninths, y was 7 ninths, and I got my answer. Does that make sense? Now, did I lose you guys anywhere? Hmm. Have you done this kind of stuff before? What grade? What grade? Fifth grade, okay. The rest of them probably ninth grade. Okay, so fifth grade, ninth grade, somewhere. You have done this kind of stuff before, right? All right. So, let's try another one. Again, I'm just trying to kind of set you guys up with, all right, uh, how to do these particular uh, problems here. So, let's see here. What have we got here? I have uh, X minus... 3y is equal to, sorry, 2x plus 6y is equal to, oh there we go. All right. Find the solution for this guy. Well, help me out here. What would you do? All right, we do the same thing what we did before, right? Use the same algorithm. Let's see what happens. So I'm here, I'm going to solve for x by, again, using the same algorithm. Again, just kind of talking about it. Solve for x here. x would be equal to, I would add 3y to both sides. So I get x equals 3y plus 5. With me? Okay. And now I've got this other equation, which is the negative 2x plus 6y equals 1. I'm going to replace place the x so I can get that equation with terms of one variable on this thing. 
So this would give me negative 2 times 3y plus 5, replacing the x, plus 6y equals 1. So once again, I get an equation in terms of that one variable that allows me to, quote, solve for x. So let's solve for x here. I'm going to distribute. So this will give me negative 6y uh, minus 2 plus 5 is what? Minus 10 plus 6y equals 1. Combine my term, negative uh, 6y plus 6y. What's that? I'm afraid they cancel. I'm left with negative 10 equals 1. Hmm. I've got no variables to solve for. What is this telling me? What's that? Inconsistent. Well, it's either uh, consistent infinite or inconsistent. And how do you know the difference? All right, look at the result. Negative 10 and equals 1. So it's negative 10 equals 1. This is a false statement. Does that make sense? Negative 10 does not equal 1. That automatically implies that your solution is what? Inconsistent. Just put inconsistent. Uh, granted, no solution is fine, but... We're going to use the fancy terminology because this is math 2164, and this is the way our textbook tells us. We'll call this inconsistent. That means no solution, granted. Okay? One more. Okay? 2x plus 3y is equal to 5. Negative 4x minus 6y is equal to negative 10. Solve this one. Yeah, I threw some heavier coefficients at you now. Okay? Solve. And that's my directions here. I gave you a system of equations. I'm asking you to solve. Okay? What you do first? You can do elimination. Well, yeah, okay. We can do, you want to change my algorithm. Oh, that's bad, but okay, we'll do it. Okay, elimination. Okay. What exactly is elimination? So it's a different algorithm of how to get this. What you got? Okay, so again, let's talk about the algorithmic method of the elimination. The elimination method, the goal is to make the equations, as you analyze the equations, the goal is to focus on a particular one of your variables and to make sure that the coefficient in front of a, that particular variable that you focus on, in this case, either the x or the y, focus on one of them, that, are, that the coefficients are equal but opposite. You know, you could say, well, you, all you got to do is just make them the same thing. Yeah, but let me tell you something, brother. What your goal here is in that system of equations, you want to add equations together and try to eliminate the variables. You really don't want to subtract equations. Well, what's the difference? Well, it's just been plus and minus, and minus, you got to screw it up. If you add, the chances are you'll probably not make a mistake on it. Because now at this point, we're talking about careless error. So the goal here, to make it simple, is you have equal but opposite coefficients so you can add the equations together and eliminate the answer one of the variables. All right? So if we're going to do the elimination method that you brought up, what would I do? I would multiply the top equation. I'm going to focus on my x's. I got a 2x and I got a minus 4x. I want to have the exact same coefficient, but I want to have them opposite. Well, this one's already a negative, this one's already a positive. So all i got to do is multiply the top equation, not just the coefficient, the top equation. Because what you do to one side of the equation, you do the other, you do it to the entire thing. Does that make sense? So I'm going to multiply the top equation by 2. So this would give me, if I distribute, 4x plus 
2 times a 3y is a 6y equals 2 times 5 is 10. And the bottom equation you didn't touch, so that's negative 4x minus 6y equals negative 10. And then, again, your focus here is on the x's. I don't care about the rest of it. Equal but opposite coefficients. And then I can just add these equations together and eliminate one variable, allowing me to solve for the other variable. So again, it's another algorithm, but that describes to me a particular method of how to, quote, get the variable by itself. So what is 4x plus a negative 4x? What's 4x minus 4x? That's the whole purpose. That cancels. That eliminated the x's. But in this example, I've got a 6y minus 6y. That is a 0y, or pretty much 0. The equal to lines up. This is equal to. And what is 10 minus 10? 0. So once again, I've got one of these situations where my variables completely cancel, just like the last one. But here's the difference. What's the result? What's, what's the left over on this thing? 0 equals 0. And you don't always get 0. Sometimes you get 5 equals 5 or negative 3 equals negative 3. You get more. But what you get here is what's left over here is not a false statement like you got before. This is a true statement. Zero does equal zero. What does that tell me? So it is, is what? Consistent infinite. Sense. But what does consistent infinite really mean? There's an infinite number of answers. And I was very particular when I talked to you guys about this just a few minutes ago. Well, any point will work, right? That's the infinite number of solutions, right? Well, that's wrong. 45, negative 17. Is that going to work this thing? Probably not. I didn't know that. So, I just got to be real particular. How, what's going on here? Consistent infinite means they are the same equation, right? Same equation is what you were working on. So I've got to figure out a way of describing the solution, right? Since they're the same equation, the solution, there's an infinite number of them, the solution is going to be x, y, but since it's the same equation, you should take one of these equations and just solve for y. I'm going to use the top equation. 2x plus 3y equals 5. I'm going to solve for y here. And so I would subtract 2x from both sides. That gives me 3y equals negative 2x plus 5. Then I'm going to divide by 3. What I do to one side or the other? What I do to one term or do to all terms? I end up getting y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds. I said this. Well, when you have that consistent infinite, you there's an infinite number of solutions on the line, right? You've got to be on this line. 45, negative 32 is not on this line. I just made him up. What is on this line? It is these points. X comma Y, you replace Y with the negative 2 thirds X plus 5 thirds. So it's consistent. So you can write an answer, but X can be any real number. That's where the infinite part comes from. Does that make sense? So, all right, let me give you an example. X equals 1. If X equals 1, what is Y equal to? I'll hurt yourself. 1, good, okay. Negative 2 thirds times 1 is negative 2 thirds plus 5 thirds is 3 thirds. 3 thirds is also known as 1. Now, I warned you about these fractions. So, 1, 1 is a solution on this line. 2 comma positive 1 third is another point. This is a different number of points. You pick whatever x you want, it's going to be, but you got to plug that x into this equation to be able to get y. And it doesn't matter which equation you do because they're the same equation. So when you solve for y, you get the exact same equation. Does that make sense? Yeah. But this concept of elimination. You picked it. I, 
excellent algorithm to do with this thing. All right. So how can we basically solve some equations here? Well, a couple of things we can do. Now, have this system of equations, okay? And I remember writing this for you last time, so let's beat him up again. The AX plus BY equals C, and the uh, DX plus EY equals F. My system of equations, and that's what I will call it. System of equations, okay? Now, talk about what the coefficients of x and y. Again, your problem that I'm having with linear algebra is I'm trying to get you into terminology. Well, same old terminology we use in algebra. It is called linear algebra. What does the word coefficient mean to you guys? It's the constant coefficient in front of the variable. So if I want to talk about the coefficients of the x and y, they are the a, b, I am trying to put them in order, the D, and the E. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to put a big old block around this guy. And when you put them and they have this rows and columns of numbers, so this is called a matrix. That's right, day one we start talking about matrices. Okay, matrix. This is the coefficient matrix. Okay? There is the constant matrix. Order matters. What are my constant? It's equal to C and F. That's the constant matrix. Okay? And again, I'm trying to again discuss terminology with you guys. So, these are the coefficients. There's the equal to, and there's the constant. So, we can do something like this. Okay? We can use something called an augmented matrix. What is an augmented matrix? All right, terminology. To augment means we are going to be basically pushing these two equations, I mean these two matrices together to make one bigger matrix. So the augmented matrix would be this. A B, C, a D, E, put a little line there, and put your C, F there. And that little line's kind of a little invisible line, but you can see the two matrices kind of being mashed together on this thing. Okay? That is what we're calling about the augmented matrix. All right. Questions? Have I lost you anywhere? All right, so let us solve a particular problem, okay? Here we go. Example here. I have x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x3 is equal to 1. Okay? How many variables I got on this thing? Three. X1, X2, X3. Okay. Here's the next one. 2x1 minus x2 equals 0. I am trying to line these guys up. Doing you a favor right now. X1s are underneath each other, X2s are underneath each other. This equation doesn't have an X3, so I left a little space there. Equal to zero. And then this last equation is 7X2 plus 2X3 is equal to 4. Okay? 
that two things. It is a system of equations, but I up the ante. The last example I did, I had two variables and two equations. How many variables I got this time? Three. X1, X2, X3. And I got three equations. So if it has a chance of being solved, we should be able to solve it. And now, let's talk about how to solve this thing. Well, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to rewrite this equation augmented matrix. What would it be? The augmented matrix would be that coefficient matrix where the equal to is where you put your little dotted line because that's the, uh, the D constant uh, matrix. So what would it be? What is the coefficient from X1 understood to be even though you don't see anything in it? One. So that'd be one, five, negative three, augment, first equation, one. Second equation is two, negative one, zero, zero. In your third equation, there is no X1, so that's zero. A seven X2, a two X3 equals augment, that is your augmented matrix. Does that make sense? All right. So, this is called, this first equation, when you put it in a matrix, is called your, uh, basically, your first row. Your second equation is your second row. And your third equation is your third row of your augmented matrix. What's the point of the augmented matrix is, well, it helps you save some time. You notice when I worked on the first two examples where I did the substitute method, I had I kept kind of carrying over this X and this Y thing here. But when we did the elimination method, all I had to do was just line up variables, and my goal was to focus on the coefficients. Well, since you're focusing on the coefficients, positioning is everything, so why even write the coefficients? The first column is the X1 column. The second column is the X2 column. The third column is the X3 column. Your dotted line is your equal to, and the fourth column is that constant matrix, what it was equal to. So, and then you just don't have to keep writing X, Y, and Z, or in this case, X1, X2, and X3 all over the place. All right? So let me turn the page here. Now, don't worry, we'll come back to this page in a second, so I'll put him to the side here. All right. So, when it comes to solving a linear system, Okay, there are three basic algorithmic operations that you're going to use. And it comes from that elimination. These are called elementary O operations. Why rows? Because the rows represent the equations. Okay? So this is that elimination we're talking about. We're just going to extend it to a particular format of what we can do. All right? Okay, so what are the things that you can do? The first thing you can do is, I'll put this number one here, is you can interchange two equations. It won't change a thing. You had the first equation, second equation, third equation. Is it really going to bother you to write the second equation, third equation, put the first equation at the bottom? No, they're still the same equations, right? So you can interchange. Now, I'm old school, so I have to tell you how I memorized this, and I'm also setting you up for programming later. This would be basically a row swap. You can swap the rows, okay? It doesn't matter whether you write the first equation or the second one. Row swap. That's different from columns. Columns are different from rows. Rows are the equations. Okay? Number two. You can do something called scaling. Scaling is basically multiply all 
of a row, which is an equation, by a constant. Okay? And it's sad, but I have to put this non-zero constant. You know, multiply by zero is kind of lame. You, know, you don't want that to do that. That's just you're killing off the entire equation. You want to kill off the equation, but you may want to change the coefficients a little bit. You got them nicer looking. So I've got the equation x plus y equals 1. What's the difference between that one and 2x plus 2y equals 2? You multiply every equation by 2, it's still the same equation. It's just got a constant difference. It's called scaling. You can multiply every term. Every, all the entire, all of the row, which is the equation by the same constant. Number three, this is uh, the replacement. This is the goal. You can replace one row. by the sum of itself and a multiple of other row. Now, order matters, so this is the big one. I'm saying this. If you got this equation right here, I can take that equation and replace it with that equation being added to one of the other equations times a constant plus that equation. So you can take that row, add that row to a constant times another row. You can take that equation and replace it with that equation with the uh, plus a constant times one of the other equations. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm, so this is important. Take an equation and replace it with that same equation being added to one of the other equations, one of the other rows, being multiplied times a constant. I'll find that, that scaling thing here. All right, so. Here was my matrix. 1, 5, negative 3, augmented with 1. It was 2, negative 1, 0, 0, and 7, 2, 4. Okay? What would I like to do? I want to try to solve this thing. And I'm looking at it as a matrix. Remember, this is representing x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x1 equals 1. 2x1 minus x2 plus 0x3 equals 0. 0x1 plus 7x2 plus 2x3 equals 4. And it still represents the equation. The addition is everything. So, what I would like to do here is this. Okay? I would like to see that I only got two equations right here with these uh, two unknowns. So, I'm going to focus on this one. Again, this is, I'm going to show you a faster way to do this, but I'm going to understand what exactly I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay. All right, sorry, thought you would. So from that matrix, I, I didn't make him up. It's the same one we did. I just put this into its place. So what the things we can do. But if you go back and look at these equations, this was x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x3 equals 1. And I've got 2x1 minus x2 plus 0x3 equals 0, right? Now, I'm talking about that elimination method that we were talking about before, right? I want to eliminate an x1. I like that one x1 there. I want to eliminate this guy. How would you eliminate, and this is for your benefit, eliminate one of the, the x1? How do I do that? What was the method I did before? Okay, so I'm going to multiply the first equation by equal but opposite. So I would multiply it by a negative 2, agreed? And this would come down here and give me the equations negative 2x1 minus 10x2 plus 6x3 equals negative 2.
And then I got the same equation, x, uh, 2x, uh, 2x1 minus x2 equals 0. You with me? Now, I'm going to add these two equations together. Again, they stand for coefficient, right? Equal but opposite coefficient. When I do, that eliminates the x's. That's the point. I've got negative 10x2 minus 1x2 is a negative 11x2. I've got 6x3 plus no x3. That gives me plus 6x3 equals negative 2 plus 0 is negative 2. Does that make sense? Now, oh, did I just, we need to get a multiple of this equation and add it to this equation. According to my replacement, you get to replace one of the rows by taking the sum of itself and a multiple of the other row. So we did the multiple of this row right here and add it to this row. So if I look at this guy from a matrix perspective, what was my coefficients? What are the coefficients? Remember, there's an x1, but there is no x1. It's negative 11 x2, 6 x3, augmented with 2. Does that make sense? Focusing on the coefficients, but we eliminated the x1s. Right? But according to my algorithm, my, uh, quote, three basic ro elementary row operations, I get to replace this matrix, if you will, with one of the rows. Which one am I going to replace it with? The first, second, or the third? And it does matter. Which one? The second one. Why the second one? We multiplied the first one, and according to this, you get to replace the row by a row when you take the sum of itself with another row. This is the same row. We didn't manipulate, we didn't multiply by this row. We multiplied by this one. The one we add to that we don't actually multiply by is the one we replace. Does that make sense? So, as you just said, it's the second equation. So, I'm going to get this matrix now. I get the first equation, 1, 5, negative 3, augment 1. The second equation, that's the one that's going to get replaced here with the 0, negative 11, 6, 2, and the third equation is 0, 7, 2, 4. Now, I went old school here, and I wrote up the equation to show you what I was doing. Question. Yeah, uh, it should be negative 2. Sorry, that is negative 2 right there. Thank you. All right. But my point to this is I didn't have to write all these equations over here. So I'm trying to show you guys more of a shortcut method on doing this thing. So... I've got myself down to this equation, okay? Now, again, every time you do something or other, there's a system of equations with this guy. So if you wanted to look at the relationship here, this is x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x3 equals 1. This is 0x1 minus 11x2 plus 6x3 equals negative 2. This is 0x1 plus 7x2 plus 2x3 equals 4. This is the equation. This is the matrix version of the equations. You should be able to see the one-to-one -one correspondence on this. Does that make sense? So now, just because I need room, I'm going to write this guy over here. As I have this matrix of 1, 5, negative 3, augmented with 1, and 0, negative 11, 6, negative 2, and 0, 7, 2, 4, okay? I want to continue on. But what I'm focusing on is I got two zeros right here. So if you just focus on these last two equations, this is just a negative 11x2 plus 6x1, uh, 6x, sorry, x3 there, that's the third one, equals negative 2, and 7x2 plus 2x3 equals 4. How would you want to eliminate this guy? But i got to keep in the back of my mind, I've only got three operations, because I'm really trying to manipulate the matrix here. Well, what I would like to do, and you know you're going to hate it, is I can 
always scale. In terms of scaling, I like units. <laughs> okay, also known as pivots when I get you into the term. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that equation, negative 11x2 plus 6x3 equals negative 2, and I'm going to multiply by negative 1 over 11. I know you hate it because it's fractions, but oh, okay. So when I do this, it would be the same as that second row, 0, negative 11, 6, negative 2, being uh, multiplied by a negative 111. I want to show you the relationship here. Here I'm going to distribute. This will give me x2 minus 6 elevenths x3 is equal to a positive 2 elevenths, because the negative times the negative is a positive. Over here, this would give me negative 11 times 0 is 0, negative 111 times 0 is 0, negative 111 times negative 11 is 1, uh, negative 6 over 11 augmented 2 over 11. My point is, it's the same thing, and it takes me less time to write it. Okay? Does that make sense? So that would be my next move, and if I chunked it into my matrix, I would have this, because when you scale it, notice I didn't add it to any other equation, it's just a scaling, I can replace an equation with its scaling. So again, I'm going to replace the second row there, 1, 5, negative 3, 1, 0, 1, <clears throat> negative 6 elevenths, 2 elevenths, I mean 11. And then the third equation is 0, 7, 2, 4. Now, why did I want to do that? Because remember my rule. I can take one equation and add it to that same equation plus a multiple of another equation. Okay? That's my rule. So if you look at this equation, which is x2 minus 6 elevenths x3 equals uh, 2 elevenths. And I got the other equation, which is 7x2 plus 2x3 equals 4. How would you eliminate the x2 variable? So let's eliminate x2. What would you do? I would multiply this top equation by negative 7, right? And if I did that, come down here. Negative 7x2 plus, what's negative 7 times a negative 6 elevenths? Don't worry me, what's 7 times 6? Really? 42. One person out of the 45 people I have in here. What's 7 times 6? Okay, just checking because this is where you guys are going to die at. Over 11, see, no calculator. It takes too long to go find my calculator over here. You've got to wait to get this problem done. Times x3 is equal to negative 7 times 2 elevenths is what? Negative 14 elevenths. And I got the other equation, which was 7x2 uh, plus uh, 2x3 equals 4. And when you add them together, the x2 cancels. You with me? All right. Let me grab a calculator now because this is looking ridiculous. Well, I could do it without a calculator, but you guys won't pay me now. So I got 42 elevenths plus 2, which is uh, 22 elevenths, plus 22 elevenths, just to let you know. That gives me, in terms of fractions here, 64 elevenths. This will be 64 over 11. X3 is equal to negative 14 elevenths plus 4, just adding them together. And that gives me 30 elevenths. Does that make sense? And that's a new equation. And which equation do I get to replace him with? The one we added to. Which equation did we just add to? See, this one, we multiplied this, this equation by negative 7. When you multiply, you don't get to replace it. But we added it to the, second, uh, to the third equation. So you get to replace the third equation with it, which gives me this. 1, 5, negative 3, augmented with 1. 0, 1, negative 6, 11, 2 over 11. And the third equation is now 0, 0. There's no x1, there's no x2. A 64 over 11 and equal to a 30 over 11. Now let's go finish this thing up.
because I've only got like four minutes to do it. So here we go. Again, I would like to scale this equation because I like coefficients of 1. Make sense? So I'm going to multiply this 64 over 11 x3 is equal to 30 over 11. I'm going to multiply it by 11 over 64. Why 11 over 64? Because that's going to give me a coefficient of 1 in terms of this equation. So these multiply cancel out. You get this x3 is equal to 11 over 64. They cancel, so I'm left with 30 divided by 64, which is, okay, a crappy fraction of 15 over 32. Yeah, I probably should do that one. 15 over 32. So, and I get to replace. All I did was scale this guy. So now this would be 1, 5, negative 3, augmented 1, 0, 1, negative 6 over 11, 2 over 11, 0, 0, 1, and I get 15 over 32. Does that make sense? Now, what I can do now is this. I can either solve it this way or I can work my way back to check. X3 equals 15. Where this one? 64 over 11? No, where? Where is the fraction that you know? Six, 64 over 11. X3 is equal to 30 over 11. Which one is 11 over 11? That one? No, no, the one on the far right there. On the this one? Yeah. 11 over 64. Yeah, okay. What I did to one side, I did the other. I need to multiply by both equations. So 11 over 64 is so I get that coefficient here. But now, here's my point here. Okay, what does this actually mean? This means you got the first equation. x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x3 is equal to 1. You've got x2 minus 6 elevenths x3 equals 2 elevenths. And I get x3 equals 15 over 32. You with me? And double check there. Let's see here. Yep. All right, so if you notice, I already have one of the answers. How would you find the other guy? I can go back and plug it in. This gives me x2 minus 611 times x3, which is 15 over 32, is equal to 2 elevenths, right? And then I could just move this to the other side, and I got 2 divided by 11, moving it over, plus... 6 divided by 11 times uh, 15 over 32. Crappy fraction. What crappy fraction do I get? I get x2 to be equal to 7 over 16. Does that make sense? And then I could, now I got these two answers. I can go back to the first equation. x1 plus 5x2 minus 3x3 equals 1. And that gives me x1 plus 5 times x2, which is six, uh, 7 over 16, minus 3 times 15 over 32 is equal to 1. And I can solve for x1 by moving these to the other side. And I'll just show you quickly. That'll be 1 minus, we move to the other side, 5 times 7 divided by 16, plus, move to the other side, 3 times 15 divided by 32. And I'm getting crappy fraction of 7 over 32. Does that make sense? I did that elimination of the back substitution. But last thing before I let you go, if I rewrote this guy, these guys as equations, augmented of course, you get this. You get 1x1, there is no x2. There is no x3, but what's it equal to? 7 over 32. This equation, there is no x1, there's 1x2. There is no x3, but it's equal to 7 over 16. And this equation, x3, which was this last row, which was 0, 0, 1, and you get 15 over 32.
and then you've got to have the u consistent, unique solution to the matrices. But I'm doing this kind of tandem of trying to manipulate the equations and show you the relationship of the matrices. Next time, I'm going to drop the equation stuff with the x1s, x2s, and x3s and just do the routine with the actual uh, matrix and how to do matrix, multiple, uh, matrix uh, row operations to be able to find a solution to this guy. So I'm trying to tie in what you guys did back in the fifth, ninth grade, whatever it is, all the way up to bigger equations. But we'll work on that next time. So study hard. We'll finish up 1.1, move on into section 1.2. That'll be on Thursday. See you guys then.